Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the 2020 iteration of the Black Artist Talk. My name is Melissa Diaz, and I am the Cultural Arts Curator at the Deering Estate. Um, so I get the pleasure of working with all our amazing artists. I get the honor today of introducing our current artist in residence who has been with us since 2016, Miss Michelle Grant Murray. Um, a little bit about Miss Michelle Grant Murray. Uh, she's a choreographer, performer, educator, author, and social activist. She's presented work in Europe, South America, Asia, the Caribbean, and the United States, and is currently the artistic director of the Alujimi Dance Theater and Miami-Dade College Jubilation Dance Ensemble, as well as the coordinator of dance at Miami-Dade College Kendall Campus. And you can look no further than her Rate My Professor account to see the tremendous impact she has had on her students. Um, she is a very giving artist, both to her work and to her students and to us, the staff at Deering Estate. So we are overjoyed to have her here with us today. And with that, I take it over, I pass it over to you, Michelle, to introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, first, I want to say, yes, I am Michelle Grant Murray. Thank you for introducing me and welcome to the Black Artist Talk. Today, we're presenting Epistemological Apartheid and Dance Practice and Pedagogy, Decolonizing Methodologies. I first want to take a moment to honor definitely our ancestors and those people who have come before us. I am so excited that last night I finally received the information of the Black people that made Daring the States possible. And I want to call their names as I pour this libation and honor them. And if you want to take a moment and just place the names of your ancestors inside of the chat, and you can call them out by name as well, I would thank you for that. William Cash, Theoph Theophilus Roll, Henry Rhodes, Joseph Richardson, Walter Wright, Richard Kinney, Adolphus Parks, Samuel Clark, Melvin Butler, E.W.F. Stirrup, Laban Bethel, Francis Strawn, Hezekiah Brooks, Little Griff, Thomas Lloyd, Shepard Huston, and Luke Crowell. I honor you. As we move forward today, I also want to take a moment to honor the land that Deering Estates resides on, the land of the Tequesta, Calusa, Paleo, Seminole, and Miccosukee. Thank you, and I look forward to this exciting conversation that we bring forth today. I would like to stay, thank the Deering Estate staff and faculty and the board for their generous and kind, kind gestures inside of this space. Thank you so much for allowing me to move forward with the Black Artist Talk. This is our, my fourth year there and the fourth Black Artist Talk. Thank you so much. I also want to thank our panelists for the Black Artist Talk, Florencia Guerra, Augusto Soledad, Tiffany, Merritt Brown, Melissa Kobala, and Akitha Carey. And I wanna thank my partner in crime, Brittany Williams. Thank you so very, very much for always standing by my side. I also wanna say thank you to the Florida Black Dance Artist Organization. If you're not familiar, please Google floridablackdance.com and follow us. It's a great experience. The Black Artist Talk is dedicated to engaging conversations with Black artists to discuss current events, the arts, dance making, pedagogy, social justice, history, and the future. The here and the now. The Black Artist Talk was developed in 2016 while serving as an artist in resident at Deering Estates in 2016. The work, this process, this, this conversation has taken place in many places throughout South Florida. And I'm really excited to be here once again with Deering Estates sharing in this moment. The panelists that we will hear today extend from many different professional backgrounds in dance, which will make this experience dynamic and thought provoking. Akitha Carey, Melissa Kobala Gutierrez, Florencia Guerra, Tiffany Merritt Brown, and Augusta Soledadji each bring distinct perspectives that explore the expressions of Black culture as a conduit for education, ecology, sustainability, and social justice. During this conversation, the participants, the panelists, we will all address the various issues regarding colonization of artistic dance spaces and provide solution-based concepts that will hopefully generate equality and equity and innovative ways to strengthen dance practices and enhance inclusivity within dance curriculums around the world, performances and rehearsal spaces. Please take a moment and reserve your comments and your questions until the end 
as we would like to get through the, the, the panelists, get through the presentations. So I thank you for that. Feel free to engage the chat. This is Black Space and we wanna keep it lively. So go ahead and engage that chat. You have an ashe, you got a hallelujah. Go ahead and put it inside the chat. We honor that. Now we'll take a moment for each one of the panelists to introduce themselves and thank you once again for participating and I cannot wait to get this party started. Let's move. Thank you. And we'll start with Florencia. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Florencia Garrier, um, Miami native, born, raised and trained here. Um, I am an arts ad administrator, dance educator, choreographer, and still professional dancer. Um, and I'm excited to be here. Welcome, everyone. From Florencia, we'll move to Augusto. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome. Uh, my name is Augusto Saladaji, and I am the artistic director of Augusto Saladaji Breast Dance, and I am also an associate professor at the University of Florida. I want to just take a quick minute to uh, introduce the dancers in my background, uh, if, in case you enjoy. Um, I have Brittany Williams uh, to my left here. I don't know if you see it on your left in, in the screen. And then on this other side, I have uh, Roderick Calloway, and uh, Manuela Sanchez. Tiffany Merritt Brown. Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Merritt Brown. I'm a dancer, scholar, educator, and activist who lives here in Miami, Florida. I'm so excited to be here. I'm also one of the founding members of the Florida Black Dance Artists Organization and currently an MFA candidate in dance and social justice at the University of Texas. I'm so happy to see you all and just welcome. I'm excited to share with you all about decolonization. Melissa Cobala Gutierrez. Hello everyone, good evening. My name is Melissa Cobala Gutierrez. I'm currently um, in Miami, Florida. I'm a Cuban native. Um, I'm currently a performer dancer with Olujimi Dance Theater and Urban Bush Woman. I'm also the found, one of the founders of the Florida Black Dance Artists Organization and uh, the Woodshed Online Dance Platform together with Michelle Grant Murray and Brittany Williams. And I'm very excited to be here sharing with everyone. And Akifa Carey. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Akitha Carey, originally from the Bahamas, artist, scholar, um, currently in the dual degree program at FIU um, in the African and African Diaspora Studies and the Global Sociocultural Studies, also a founding member of the Florida Black Dance Artists Organization and a dancer with Alojimi. Um, Happy to be back home, um, full circle. So returning to Florida after a very long hiatus. So hitting the ground running. Thank you. Thank you all. So what I'd like to do now is for us all to take a deep breath, take a deep breath. We're gonna take three deep breaths to ground us into this space so that we can go forward. Here we go. One, two, three, inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale. Inhale, hold for three seconds. Three, two, one, and exhale. And thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate this. So we're going to move forward. We have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, afternoon planned. And I hope that the participants are engaging. We are, we can see everybody. I think it's important to see faces and we're trying to social distance and maintain, but I do wanna be able to connect with people. I love that process of being able to connect and see your eyeballs, see your cheeks, see your lips, see your skin. Let me see you. So that's great. And I understand if you don't wanna see us, that's fine too. That's all good. <laughs> um, 
So we're going to move forward. Our first presenter is Florencia Guerra, and we will move forward with that. Thank you so much. Remember to hold your questions to the end, or please place them in the chat. Thank you. Okay. So I um, started all of my dance training in ballet. Um, and to this day, ballet is still one of my first loves. So my presentation today is going to be focused on the dance classroom and how we can decolonize the dance classroom starting with ballet and the ballet curriculum. So when I say decolonizing, it means more than just adding in texts or blanketed facts or learning ma materials from authors who are black, indigenous or people of color. To decolonize your dance classroom is a systematic approach to not only what you are teaching, it is who you are teaching and also how you teach and assess those students. It means that you acknowledge the systems of dominance, racist tendencies, and everything else that exists in our society, organizations, and our classrooms. And that you are constantly working to break away those systems so you can make your space more equitable and just for each and every student. And so this starts with ballet and the role that ballet has played in the oppression of black, indigenous and people of color. And then looking at ballet and redefining its history and its pedagogies. So the first thing that, we, that I would like to talk about is the what. What is it that we are teaching about ballet in our dance classrooms? Because context is essential and the art of dance is no exception. Context helps us to create connections between past and present, and it provides clarity in which art and culture can be fully understood. So dance education that focuses solely on the physical parts of dance, how we are moving through space, creating shapes and everything else with no context of the origins of the techniques that we are actually looking at and learning about is very harmful to our dancers. Dance is literally the physical manifestation of culture, history, and belief systems people all across this, this world. So giving our dancers true and proper context of those histories is very important. And this is why saying, saying things like ballet is the foundation of dance is very, very dangerous. It is not only inaccurate, but it is built upon white European oppression. Ballet and Western dance is still at the forefront of dance training and dance technique. It is being taught as the foundation of dance and the standard for which we measure dance technique, or rather what is good dance technique. The assumption that ballet, a European cultural dance form, serves as the foundation of other dance forms from other cultures is actually silly and it's wrong because other cultures and their dance forms have existed for centuries and centuries prior to the foundation and the start of ballet in and of itself. This view is Eurocentric and it gives you this, this idea where white culture is the default and all other cultures and art forms that are a deviation from white culture that white culture is the standard and that other art forms are just the deviation from it. So you don't need to have strong ballet in order to be a good dancer in other dance techniques that have come from other cultures, from Africa, from the Caribbean, from Asia. And we have to remember that Africa is a vast continent of over 54 countries with many, many thousands of tribes, thousands of languages and even more dances, right? So this pedestal that ballet has been placed on, especially in the Western dance world, it creates this, this constant flow of systemic racism in our classrooms and it serves no one. Our, our, our students are given a limited education 
it is in, incomplete and it tells them that ballet is more important than any other form. So the truth is, is that ballet is the start of decolonization in our classrooms. It shouldn't be placed above other dance tech techniques, but it should be on equal status because to say that ballet is more important than other dance tech techniques also implies that every other genre of, of dance has no formal training, skill, or technique that is required. So it is important that we teach ballet for what it really is. Teach the full history of ballet and how ballet has been used to cultivate systemic oppression. If we present ballet as anything other than equal to other culturally derived dance techniques, we are diminishing other people's value and culture. And to place ballet on the same level as other dance forms does not take away the value that ballet has and the benefits that ballet has. But what it does is it creates a safe space for dancers to truly value other dance forms and to learn history outside of the lens of Eurocentric views. So next we have the who, right? And this, this can be addressed in two different ways. So the first one that I'm going to speak on is who are the people that are being presented as ballet's top influencers? Because the con contributions of black, in, indigenous and people of color and dance is extensive and it is, it is very vast. So as dance educators, when we teach about the impact that Black dance artist has, has had in ballet, it doesn't begin with Arthur Midgew and it doesn't end at Misty Copeland. There have been so many other artists who have done so many great things for ballet in the ballet world. And not just dance artists, but composers, costume designers, set designers. It is an unlimited amount, right? So we have been impacting and inspiring dance for as long as dance has been around and ballet is not an exception. And for too long, our dances, our cultures and our histories have been appropriated. We have been mocked for entertainment and we have been left untaught in the dance classrooms, especially within ballet. Because the reality is, is that cisgendered white male choreographers have dominated ballet since the beginning of it, since its inception. And because of that, we have a very long, long list of examples of a racist tradition in ballet choreography and in ballet aesthetics. So I'm gonna show a few examples of races or oppressive choreographic themes or cost costumes in some of ballet's most oldest and most cherished pieces and from some of our favorite choreographers. But it is important that we take a look at these things because it, it's not to say that we can't teach them in our classroom, but it's how we are teaching them and how we are presenting these choreographers because if we just present them the way we've been doing for the last four or five centuries or decades, um, then we are getting nowhere. And we aren't giving our students the full view of how other races can play or have played an important role in ballet. So we're gonna start with the, the, the Chinese scene and Balanchine's Nutcracker. It is a Christmas classic. Um, studios, schools, companies, everyone does the Nutcracker. What's wrong with the Nutcracker? Well, part of it is the Chinese theme because it's yellow face. Um, it's the choreography is very stereotyped. You have pointed fingers, you have the fan Manchu must mustaches, and it is offensive. Um, many people have stepped out and said that this is not okay. Um, you are appropriating Chinese culture, you are mocking their movements, you are mocking their culture, and some people have started taking the steps to change that, but it is still a big tradition in the nut, nutcracker world. Next, we have the 19th century, quote unquote, an ex exotic um, Maurice Petitpas ballet, La Bayadere. 
it was one of my favorite variations growing up. But, you know, as you grow up and as you get educated, you start to learn things. So what's wrong with this very, very famous ballet? Traditionally, this ballet is performed in blackface. And not only that, it parades lewdly dressed temple dancers who are dancing in a religious temple with religious eye icons in front of a lustful eyed priest. And it is supposed to be set in ancient India. Various Hindu groups have come out and spoken against this ballet. And yet it is still being performed in blackface in the year 2020. It is still using this lewdful um, choreography and religious relics of the Hindu religion in 2020 in ways that it should not be being used. So again, this is just another example of, do we follow tradition or do we do what is right? The next ballet is a folk king ballet, Petrushka. It's a little bit older than the other two ballets that I've previously stated. But in this ballet, you have a more character and he is presented as lazy, stupid, he's prone to violence, and he prays to a coconut. And the character is usually performed in blackface, still to this day. Maurice, we meet again, Maurice Petipa in his ballet, Raymonda, the villain um, is a Muslim character and he is portrayed in a very maniacal way. In many ballets, um, for some reason, people of Arab descent have become the villain in our ballets. And they're always given horrendous makeup, painted with exaggerated features and ghoulishly ashy skin that makes them look certifiably insane. And then in this ballet specifically, he has a group of people with him and they're dressed in very stereotypical Middle Eastern garb. So in this way, it is offensive in the cost costuming, but also in the movement choices. And last but not least, um, I'm a student of Miami City Ballet, so I trained under the George Balanchine technique. But we can't forget that Balanchine was a privileged white man who benefited from the appropriation of Africanistic aesthetics and jazz dance and the use of black bodies for shock value. He also fashioned the extremely thin and elongated prepubescent girl who is of course as pale as a freshly sliced apple. Because of Balanchine, a lot of the aesthetics in ballet are what they are today. Because he said, your skin has to be very, very pale and white. You have to be very frail and thin. And he really made ballet something that aesthetically isn't welcome to anyone of any skin tone that it's outside of this freshly sliced apple. And anyone who isn't long and thin and very slim. So we are at a point where ballet companies are starting to begun to undoing the work, but in my opinion, it's not happening fast enough. And it's because ballet companies want to preserve the traditions of, ball of ballet, but what are the traditions that we are trying to preserve? Slavery, racism, cultural appropriation, those things cannot be valuable to you in the sense that you won't change choreography, a cost, costume, or even what's in your repertoire. And as dance educators, when we look at these things in our classrooms, it is important that we look at them through a truthful lens. Because when ballet demeans a culture, when it stereotypes a culture, when there are racial undertones in our classical ballets, we can use those moments to educate our dancers on culture. What are the dances of this culture that we are looking at? Their spiritual practices. Who are some, some famous artists from that culture? And how is dance looked at in that culture? And where is the choreographic or in composition, this line between appreciation and appropriation? How is it that these ballets can be taken and rearranged in a way that isn't racist and, and oppressive. 
I know in my classroom, because I am a ballet educator, those are the conversations that I have with my dancers. Maybe not my seven year old dancers, but definitely when I introduce dance history and the history of ballet, I'm very truthful with my dancers about it. Because again, we don't want our dancers to have a limited view on what ballet is and the role that ballet has actually played. So the second part of who is who are our dancers? You know, as, as a dance educator, one of the greatest lessons that I learned um, was to do the necessary work to get to know my dancers beyond the expected classroom, hi, how are you, I am your teacher. And it is a lesson that I wish a lot of the ballet teachers that I had growing up was actually taught because then I felt like work could have been done to help them gain a better understanding of blackness and also how they can create a safer space in their classrooms for me and for other black dancers. So some of the things that I experienced as a student in a ballet class that I would like for us to completely wipe away with in our classrooms when it comes to teaching ballet is I was constantly being told that I didn't have a ballet body because I didn't fit this image of a very, very thin, frail ballerina with no butt, no hips, no chest, no prominent muscular tones. And Black bodies are not a monolith. I come from island genetics where my hips are wide and my thighs are thick. Biologically, there are some things that I can't change about my body and I shouldn't have to in order to be a ballet dancer or to be a ballet appreciator. I was always told to tame my hair for ballet class and I often heard statements where, I don't know what to do with your hair. In no way is it appropriate to use language like that towards anyone. Um, black hair is an art. It is not a wild animal that needs to be tamed. The requirement of wearing pink tights and pink ballet shoes, which we all know breaks the line and makes them distorted. That's the whole, the whole point of ballet is lines and aesthetics. And we're, we're breaking that line, brown skin and pink tights and pink shoes. It goes back to, it's a tradition in ballet, but in this instance, again, tradition in ballet is just upholding racist pra practices, sorry. Not being cast because all of the other dancers were white and they didn't want the image of their choreography to be broken by a black body because symmetry is more important asking me to be more urban with my movements or telling me that I'm too urban. Um, I can tell you as a black woman to this day, I don't even know what the word urban means. I feel like it is a word that has just been created because to some people is one step above ghetto, but for me, it's on the same level as ghetto, it's still offensive. And my teachers not recognizing the intersections of race and class or the Im implications that black and brown families, we have more barriers when it comes to having access to resources and wealth and or and then using the fact that I have barriers against me um, and blaming me for having those barriers as if it was something that I could con control. And so I end my presentation with how, because we started talking about what, what is ballet, what it, how is it, what is being taught in our class classrooms of, about ballet, who are we teaching and who are our dancers, but now it's, it's how, like how do we start to decolonize ballet in our dance curriculums and in our dance classrooms and how do we begin the work? What are the first steps? Um, I specifically focused on ballet because again, ballet is the pillar of dance in the Western world. And I know that it is valued because the idea is that without ballet, you can't do modern, you can't do jazz. But in reality, modern is the only tech technique that really derived from ballet. Jazz dance is an aesthetic all in its own. That is another presentation for another day. Um, and in most programs and dance studios, ballet is the standard. 
So if we decolonize ballet, it is a start to decolonizing our entire class. So the first step is honestly to make the decision to do the work. You have to understand that it is not an overnight process. It requires research, reflection, especially on our own biases that we have, and then incessantly working towards change. You can't wait for black and brown people to tell you to decolonize. You have to start it. Look up articles on decolonization, restructure and rebuild your class classroom. Call on experts in the field who are black, indigenous or people of color and then pay them for their knowledge. Don't just ask us to help you do the work, but you're not valuing our, our, our time and the, the efforts that we have made towards this process. Let go of this hold that we have on tradition because doing something the same way for a long time doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. And tradition is what ballet is. But again, the traditions of ballet is rooted in slavery and oppression and demoralization. And it's not a tradition that I would hope in 2020, anyone would be comfortable standing on. Don't reject dancers from your program because they lack ballet training. They may be well-versed in West African dance styles and Caribbean dance styles and classical Asian dance styles. And that is okay. You can allow them into your programs and then teach them ballet and then show them how their dance styles can actually help them be a better ballet dancer because I didn't become a better ballet dancer until I actually started mixing in my ancestral dances and learned how to be grounded. Ballet is so up and it's so airy, but in this world, you have to also have to learn how to be grounded and use your hips and your pelvis and use your spine. And those are the things that we don't get in ballet. That again is why I say ballet should not stand on its own. I think ballet is actually stronger when it is taught alongside and in conjunction with other dance styles. Offer multiple techniques of dance styles that are derivative of black dance, jazz, hip hop, modern. And most dance companies, um, programs, studios, even in the collegiate level, you have beginner, modern, intermediate ballet, but then you have jazz one or hip hop. It's always the elective. There, are, there, there aren't constant levels. And hip hop is so broad. A lot of people think they know what hip hop is, but hip hop is popping lock and animation, break dance. And there is, is so many techniques within just that umbrella of hip hop. Offer them all. Give your students an actual chance to learn other dance styles. Don't limit your features, your dance features to white passing or light skin dancers only, and then say that you're diverse. That's not being diverse. That's using the white passing or the light skinned person um, as a token. And being a token is very demoralizing. And that's you skating along the lines of, I am being diverse, I am moving forward, I am being progressive, but you're not really being progressive because again, you're still trying to create this whole symmetry. I can't tell you how many times I've been passed up for opportunities in the ballet world because I was considered too dark and I didn't fit in. Oh, you, you can't be in the snow scene because snow isn't brown. For classes that are centered on contemporary issues in dance, dance history, ballet history, or even dance appreciation, or anything that's similar to those titles, you have to make sure you speak directly towards race and its relation, because dance history and race go hand in hand. And just because it's an uncomfortable conversation doesn't mean that it's one that shouldn't be had. Again, I can understand that the history of ballet is ugly and some people don't like to have those conversations. Maybe you shouldn't be a dance history educator or maybe you shouldn't teach ballet because you have to be okay with showing the good and the bad because that's what truth is. Truth is the good and the bad. And don't you're limiting your dancers by only trying to paint this view of ballet and this polyanistic view everything is hunky-dory, everything is perfect. And that's not what it is. Ballet is progressing 
and so should our teaching of it. And then we also should understand that equity means giving dancers of color support, not just allowing them to grace your school or your company and then leave it at that. Again, sometimes there are limitations that black or brown people have, especially in a society that was built completely to go against them. It's not always to say that they're poor or, or they're from the hood or they're from the inner city, but it's to say, I can be a middle-class black person and still have things and barriers that are stopping me from accessing the resources of a white person who is actually from a low income family simply because I am black. So if you understand that, then you would understand that in some in instances, I do need more support. Teach your students about the contributions of black dancers, black choreographers, black compo com composers, Latinx choreographers, Latin dancers, and like just from every culture that you can. Let your dancers be well-rounded, worldly. We have this notion in America where we only think about America and we only think about the people here and the dance world is vast. Like there's no other way to say it. It's just so big. And so we definitely shouldn't limit our ex exposure. And then take the initiative to research and learn and create an equitable and safe space for all of your dancers, no matter their religion, their I identity, that can be a whole nother conversation. Um, and their orientation, because safe space and decolonizing dance is not just something that affects black dancers, indigenous dancers and dancers of color, but it affects dancers who identify in non-binary ways. It affects dancers who have different orientations, dancers who have a different religion. You may have a Muslim student and you have to honor them and honor their belief system within your classroom. It is a lot of work. And just because I am a black woman educator doesn't mean that I don't see that and that um, it is something that doesn't re re require strength. So we can't allow ourselves to get tired because this work doesn't come easy. And just because it may be inconvenient doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Giving up is a privilege. I don't have the privilege of giving up because I am one of few um, black female ballet teachers. I don't have the privilege of giving up because I have my, 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 my goal is to make sure that ballet is a technique that is safe and it is a technique that black bodies can enjoy because for so long, we've been told that ballet wasn't for us, that we weren't built the um, right way and we didn't have the right, right look. So, for me, my livelihood is at stake. My students' livelihoods are at, at stake. So giving up is not a privilege that I have. But if you have the privilege of giving up, if it is something that you can walk away from because it doesn't affect you, I implore you not to give up simply because you may be feeling uncomfortable or inconvenienced. You just can't. You know, um, your your con convenience is no more is not more valuable than my life or the life of another black dancer. You will make mistakes. You will fall short because these structures run deep and they are ingrained in the very fibers of our country, our communities, and our artistic spaces. But it is work that needs to be done devotedly. And it is work that happens every day. It's not you teach one lesson and then you're done. Um, so again, my, my biggest takeaway is teaching the truth about ballet, creating ballet to be open to other cultures, um, changing the racist pedagogies and standards that ballet stands on, and then understanding that Ballet is a great benefit to every dancer who has the chance to learn it, but it is not the only technique that we can benefit from. Um, and we are best benefited from ballet when we learn about ballet outside of the Eurocentric white supremic lens. And we learn about 
ballet for what it is. It is a European ethnic folk dance. And just like in Europe, you have your ethnic folk dances, so do other places. And when you actually learn them together, you're a stronger, well-rounded, more versed dancer. And ballet is just a tool on your tool belt to help you do that. But you also can have other tools. You can have tap, you can have jazz. And we know in jazz, there's multiple types of jazz. You can have West African dance and you pick and pluck your tools whenever you need them. But one tool isn't more important than the other. So I thank you. Um, I hope that we can have conversation about this later if there's any Q and A. Um, and thank you for your time and for your ears. Thank you, Florencia. Well, the chat is full. I hope Florencia can take some time to go through the chat. Um, I was scrolling through and watching responses and reading the chat and having conversations in the chat myself. That was great. Thank you so much. And that's true diversity. And God said the word is dot, dot, dot. Our next presenter is Augusto Soledadje. Thank you so much, Augusto, and I will turn it over to you. 15 minutes, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Florencia, thank you. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear a presenter with so much passion like you uh, just gave us. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to share just a little uh, PowerPoint as well. But I want to say that uh, my approach to this presentation is really to share with you some thoughts. Um, I am um, at a point in my career where I'm having to think a lot about uh, a lot of different things, uh, including, you know, uh, what kind of changes I can bring upon myself, um, the way I see things, um, the way I want to do things. And so this for me became an opportunity to share some of my thoughts and to hopefully intrigue you enough that you can um, ask yourselves questions uh, that will promote some, a change for a better world. Um, so decolonizing for me, in my understanding, um, is, uh, is really about shifting perspectives and attitudes towards the canon. And uh, Florencia just did a great presentation about the canon, right? This is what we know. Ballet, for instance, has been the canon for dance for way too long, right? Uh, nearly not giving, of, giving us enough space uh, to do other things. So are you seeing my PowerPoint? Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it up just, just as, a, a, as a reference as I talk, okay? So in my view, if you are going to decolonize or undo something, uh, it's very important that you understand what it is that you want to undo, right? So in my view, colonization is what we want to undo, right? Because colonization was a specific system developed to exploit colonies in order to enrich monarchies. But what happened was that it created a mentality that I feel permeates our lives today. And that, and which is based on the exploitation and oppression of a group for the benefit of another group. And I mean, I, I have a few examples, you know, uh, colonialism itself, that concept, that construct, you know, is a, is a clear example uh, of colonization. Capitalism with its pyramid structure is another very clear um, example. And of course, racism with its oppressive power. So once you start to understand all of that, then you have to start thinking, how can I undo those things? And especially if, now I have to say, it's a little easier for you to think about how to undo something that is hurting you, that is oppressing you, than it is for those who actually benefit from that structure, right? But we've gotten to a point where it, 
has become more and more clear that the structure itself, especially when it's oppressive, it hurts both sides or it hurts everybody involved. So today, you know, many colonies around the world have ceased to exist, right? But that legacy of colonialism remains. And we see it very clearly in the educational system because the educational system has established Eurocentric perspectives as the model for knowledge, the canon. And Florencia just was very clear you know, in, in, in her presentation about that. But I want to expand my experience a little bit more because I am now in a position um, at the University of Florida where I am the dance area coordinator and I am getting an opportunity to um, uh, you know, to be in a position of leadership. Uh, recently, I had a training, you know, uh, for leaders uh, within the university. And in this training, I thought it was really interesting because at a certain point, and we understand that, you know, the University uh, of Florida is, is a white space. And, and historic, historically has been a white space. And in this training with other, um, you know, uh, faculty and staff from within the university, you know, training, uh, mostly white, of course, uh, there was a certain point when um, the, the, uh, the instructor was talking about um, a uh, successful steps to become a better leader, going from good to great. And one thing that caught my attention was that, you know, within the level that was presented, and this was an approach by a, a white author who had, you know, developed ideas and, and uh, instructions about how to succeed in leadership or as a leader. And the highest level, level five, um, uh, what you had to, what you had to accomplish was or you knew you, you got to that top level when you, uh, uh, I'm just gonna read the description of, 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 of it. So to make it a little more clear, level five builds enduring greatness through a paradoxical combination of personal humility plus professional will. That really struck me hard because I was like, wow, Personal humility, that is not the, the way I understand white supremacy, white uh, perspective, white oppressive force. I do not see humility at all in it. And to see a, a white author talking about that really made me think about, you know, where is that perspective really coming from? And if it's coming from a different culture or a different understanding of the world, why is it not being acknowledged? Why is it not being recognized? And, and that was a question that I, I have today, <laughs> you know? And, um, and I feel it's a question that we need to ask in order to try to decolonize our spaces. So sticking with uh, UF, one other aspect that I feel that is important when it comes to, you know, understanding how to decolonize spaces is to, in thinking about a different perspective, is to try to offer a perspective that brings more balance. You see, the perspective of this author in the training, to me, still, even though whatever was at the top made me question where that uh, input really came from, um, but I felt that the way it was structured was pretty much the canon, okay? It still followed a level of uh, uh, a kind of a pyramid structure that to me was really clear and represented the, you know, uh, colonial uh, perspective into education, into um, socializing, and so on and so forth. So, 
um, we have, uh, you have recently, uh, for the past year, we have really been having this conversation and I feel that um, we are at a good place now because we have a proposal to change our curriculum in dance at the university that I feel is going to offer a little bit more balance. Uh, and that proposal is that uh, we are able to implement um, a, a track that we're calling contemporary African and African diasporic dance practices that will be uh, studied by any dance major entering uh, the program for the first two years uh, in, in, in an equitable way. In other words, students will take the same amount of class in contemporary African and African diasporic dance practices as they will in uh, modern, which now we're going to be call, we're going to be calling contemporary dance practices and ballet, which we're going to be calling uh, contemporary ballet practices now, uh, ballet practices. Um, and one of the reasons that I feel that it's really important to uh, do that is to try to push for a little bit more balance, okay? Uh, and, and that was important. We, by offering the contemporary African and African diaspora dance practices, I also feel we are kind of reclaiming the roots of certain dances like Florencia mentioned jazz, hip hop, you know, which at this point, because of the racist structure that we live in, has kind of been, you know, whitened to a certain degree. There are a lot of people who study jazz, but don't even know that jazz has African American roots. And they connect jazz to a completely, uh, to a white culture or a white uh, choreographer who develop a specific uh, aesthetic or style. And that's what they learn. And so jazz, hip hop, and, and some other uh, Afro-Brazilian, West African, West African is another one. There are just so many different dances from so many different places. You know, even when we say West African, we're kind of, you know, uh, what is it making? not being so specific and not really acknowledging the specificity of culture. Uh, but we feel that these, this is a, a place, you know, within the current structure that we can try to reclaim some of the, the roots and create a little bit more balance. Um, so moving on in terms of uh, my points. So, um, Modern dance, for instance, uh, which dominates the academic setting, has been really historically uh, constructed as a white female space. And uh, it's very, I mean, if I ask anyone here who has, um, you know, who has a dance degree or has uh, studied dance in, uh, at the university level, I'm sure you all can name the mothers and the fathers of modern dance, right? And they are usually, the black ones are not usually there. They come later on, right? And, um, but the fact, the fact is, is, is that, um, you know, despite being, um, uh, or suffering some resistance, you know, at the beginning, uh, dance did succeed and establish itself as one of the disciplines uh, in academia. Um, And I know that, um, you know, talking about gender is, is, is kind of, you know, it, it can be, a, it can be a, 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 a real challenge here. Um, but I, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge and understand that white female space so that we can also pursue ways of decolonizing um, our curricula. I, I want to share a, a little video, and I'm trying to be very mindful of my time. I want to share a little video by a um, by an African artist. And give me a quick second here. Let me stop sharing this one so that I can move on with my point here. 
And let me share this other one. Oh, wrong one. Share. What's going on? Are you seeing Nora? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so this is uh, Nora Chipomery, and she's a uh, um, an African artist who has been in this uh, in the states for quite some time. And in this presentation, she's talking about the black female body, and I would like uh, you to uh, join me in hearing her words for just a couple of minutes. Well, Can you hear thank it? You. <laughs> I am happy to be here to talk about the body and its physical presence, which is clearly an undeniable fact. And the power of this presence also unrefutable. But the black body, its physical presence is undeniable. Its power, however, refutable. The African black body, its physical presence is incomprehensible and its power terribly disruptive. The African black female body, well, <laughs> the body, the black body, the African body, the female African black body. Its relationship with the rest of the world has led me to so many absurdities, so many conundrums, so many contradictions. <laughs> My black African female body has been historically on a collision course with power, with masculinity, with whiteness. At times validating these presences, but often refuting them. My body, therefore, my black African female body, is a gloriously terrible fact, a weapon, a laboratory, an experiment, a theory, a cultural and global imperative, and always potentially disruptive. So I wanted to share that because I, I really feel the power uh, in those words, you know, and I feel it really addresses the point too that I, uh, that I, you know, I, I want to touch on uh, very briefly. Um, it's, if we are thinking about decolonizing, we have to think about making the space beyond what it is right now, right? It is so clear. I mean, when we listen to Nora and all the things that she says about the perception, uh, how the, the black female body is perceived, the, how the power in its physical presence is uh, refutable and many times incomprehensible, but its power is disruptive and many times is in collision with whiteness. And that's exactly the experience that we have. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a black female, but I am a black male. And this is, um, and I, I can totally echo what is being said uh, to a point where, you know, once that became very clear to me and lately, uh, since I've been in a position of leadership, 
I started to question, you know, is there a place for a black male dance artist in this white female space? Especially if you are to occupy a position of leadership. Um, I don't have the answer um, to that. I am still trying to, you know, navigate through the uh, the structures that uh, were constructed that were in place uh, before me. Um, but, um, and I'm trying to push, you know, uh, some, uh, some notions of, of, um, of what needs to be changed and how to create balance in hope that um, that space can also change and can create a more balanced uh, environment for all of us. Uh, and my last uh, point is that um, I feel that um, decolonizing curriculum in yourself is really about self-investigation and repatterning behavior, which will generate a personal change and growth. Um, This is not easy to accomplish, right? Um, this is a, uh, it's a lot of work. This is, and as Florencia mentioned before, you know, we are usually in a position where we simply don't have the luxury not to think about it or to give up. This is something that we have to be constantly having to deal with. We have to always try to find a space, but we, we're born and grow up into this structure. And for us today, for me, I'm just gonna, you know, speak for myself here, but, you know, for me as a black male at this point, um, one of the hardest works I have to do besides, you know, trying to find a place for myself within the structure is to make sure that I am not perpetuating the structure that I was born and raised into. That's one of my biggest goals uh, for the next uh, years of my life. How can I not only decolonize, but um, also stop perpetuating the mentality, the um, approaches, the attitudes uh, that have been so uh, embedded in how I, I um, How I, uh, how I understand myself. So these are just a few thoughts. I hope that they can um, help promote uh, some thinking for yourselves too. And hopefully at the end of, um, of the presentations, we will have a, a few more minutes to, uh, to chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Augusto. So we have uh, some very interesting conversations. I hope that you all are including your, um, your questions, that you're writing them down. You can also place them in the chat. And please make sure that you keep an eye on the chat. The chat is rolling. I do want to make one comment as a dance educator and a dance historian. Um, the origin of modern dance actually comes out of cultural appropriation. Not one modern dance steps exist out of, that exists. It does not come from some cultural dance in the world. So that part of it also needs to be re-examined. Um, Peggy Choi, University of Wisconsin, actually writes about the Ma Martha Graham technique inside of a book that deals with immigration of Chinese people and Asian, Asian culture specifically in San Francisco. You all should check that out. It's great. So we're going to move on and have a conversation now with Tiffany Merritt Brown. 15 minutes. Thank you, Tiffany. You have a fan. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen and we are going to get started. I am so excited to discuss with you decolonization from the perspective of choreographic practices. 
And so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about my experience of decolonizing my own choreographic practice. Um, I am a choreographer. I probably made my first dance when I was five years old. And although I love to perform and learn about work, I also am really interested in the possibilities of choreography and the ways we can reimagine and reinform ideas in society on stage. So first uh, in talking about decolonizing choreographic practices, I think the first thing that we must do is undo. And so I define undoing as we must, um, one second, let me fix my view here. We must undo Eurocentric methodologies as tools for movement generation and stop equating them as the foundation of dance making. Um, next, we must expand. And to expand, we must expand, interrogate, and redefine our understanding of contemporary dance forms. And then lastly, we must validate, validate all forms of dance and movement expression. And so I'm so thankful that the order has gone the way it has because we've talked about the canon and ballet. You know, Ms. Murray just mentioned um, that all uh, like modern dance, all, like, all forms of modern dance come from some kind of cultural dance form. Uh, Augusta also talked about the canon and what the black body does in white space. And so I'm gonna continue to touch upon those things through the lenses of dance making. So undoing. The first step I think is in deconstructing movement school scores and tools when creating. So um, in the collegiate dance experience and even in choreographic intensives and as choreographers in the concert dance world, we oftentimes look to white tools and white structures for creating. Um, an example of that would be the elements of dance. It's super rudimentary. We say the elements of dance is based on four concepts, time, space, energy, rhythm and all together that makes form. And so we talk about, you know, how to think about creating. We look at um, things like uh, contributions from Merce Cunningham and Chance Dance. We use these tools like, you know, try to use repetition, try to retrograde your movement, try to amplify your movement, try to, you know, invert your movement. And while all of these tools are really great, they're still coming directly from a white um, experience, um, a white way of generating material and has is not culturally relevant to anyone who is not white. So that's the first thing. Um, the next thing is investigating movement that is culturally relevant. This is super important, especially in concert dance. Oftentimes what is reflected is very much movement that came out of the postmodern Judson Church um, experience from the 1960s on. So we're constantly referencing, you know, choreographers like Trisha Brown, Twyla Tharp, you know, Steve Paxton, these very much Eurocentric ideas around contact improvisation. And so when you go to these collegiate conferences like ACDA, when you see the kind of work that's being presented, everything is kind of inside of this world, which again, completely negates the cultural experiences that students come into college programs with. And then those are the modalities in which they're working when it comes to their own creation as choreographers when they leave the institution. We also need to hone our voice rigorously. Um, you cannot hone your voice if you do not know who you are. And so when we keep um, continuing to perpetuate these superimposed ideas of what dance is, what contemporary dance is, and we continue to use these tools, you, there is no individuality. Instead, what we get is that dances oftentimes look very much the same. Um, and they very much do not come from authentic places. Instead, they're very much superimposed ideas that just keep repeating the same superimposed ideas if you know, dance is more than just repetition. We also need to engage with the history living inside of our bodies. Um, what memories, what sensations, what ancestral lineages, lineages live inside of you? This is extremely important and oftentimes is not discussed when creating choreography. And again, I'm not knocking these tools. They're great tools to use. They're tools that we go to, but they're not the only set of tools. And oftentimes when studying dance history and looking at the canon and looking at the canon of choreography making, we completely negate other ideas or possibilities for creating. The, these tools become the tool. We also need to remove proscenium expectations from the choreographic process. Like um, Florencia clearly articulated, like ballet is a high art. Ballet was meant for the aristocracy. It was not made for the common man. And so these ideas of dance, not dance, become ways that we that inform our choreographic process. We want everything to be up on a stage in a theater, you know, red carpets, you want the cocktails, you want the reception and all these things, but especially in the midst of COVID-19 and a pandemic, how can we reimagine dance? And in reimagining it, how does that inform your choreographic process? 
process. Dance exists outside of these cultural institutions that we love. Um, although I love going to the theater and seeing a company in a performance, there are other ways that dance exists. Dance is life. People are dancing all the time. So how are we thinking about that when we create? And this is just my definition, which is expanded upon other people, but dance is the visual, kinesthetic, emotional, and spiritual expression of an idea communicated through the body. So how are you visually, kinesthetically, emotionally, and spiritually connecting to the ideas that you are creating in your body? It isn't um, a modality in which you should separate your soul from what your body does. And so I think these processes are really important as we think about decolonizing when creating. The next thing is to expand. So we need to expand our understanding of contemporary dance and its possibilities because that allows us to get to the core of our humanity. Again, looking at dance history, you know, when we started looking at the Judson Church and postmodern movement, we started talking about how dance reflects life. You know, dance became more avant-garde, more risk-taking. We have Yvonne Rayner with her manifesto, no to virtuosity, no to this, no to that. We are we're constantly redefining dance, but we also need to expand our understanding of contemporary dance. Um, as Ms. Murray said, and as the history books show, contemporary dance is only what it is through through the contributions of black and brown and indigenous people. So even though contemporary dance has become colonized, the foundation of it is innately black and innately Africanist. Like it comes from the continent. These ideas of groundedness, these ideas of getting in out of the floor, the pelvis, all of that comes directly from from, from the continent, there's no other way to say that. And so when we don't expand our ideas of contemporary dance, again, you're getting this pre, um, this superimposed vocabulary, a repetitive vocabulary that's not really expressing anything. It's why many of us will go to shows and say, everything looks the same. We see this in the concert dance, we see this in the commercial world. You know, I was a, a director of a high school dance program. I would take my students to competitions and everything would look the same. It's because we are not expanding our understanding of what contemporary dance is. Um, and with that, it is essential to bring our history, ancestry, heritage with us as we define contemporary dance. When we don't do this, we extract, abstract these histories to the point of erasure. There is a privilege to being ambiguous. There's a privilege to lacking specificity. You know, oftentimes when we start talking about choreography, talking about dance making, especially with young artists and talking about artistic statements, oftentimes a lot of people in this Western tradition cannot even tell you what their work is about. You ask them, so what is this dance about? Like, what? why are you creating this? What is your process? And you know, they just start saying, you know, it's the thing, you know, and I just don't know what that is. And so there is an, there's a privilege to being ambiguous. And with that, you will erase the identities of people. Um, and when we start talking about expressivity, um, like Florencia also said, we do not like to talk about race in our dance histories. And that shows up when we start creating choreography. We don't talk about the tension intersectionalities of race and dance or the oppressive structures of dance making um, in this tradition to black and brown and indigenous people. And so we think we're edgy because we want to talk about gender identity and sexuality. Um, and my response to that is, you know, gender identity and sexuality is consistently fluid, consistently changing. But when a baby is born and they are Black, there is no redefining that someone is Black. So even our ideas of race and sexuality and gender identity oftentimes um, affect the way we create. And so we love to talk about those two specific things, gender and sexuality, in creating, but then we never want to talk about Blackness and the history of Blackness before the United States, before getting here, like what happened on the continent before the slave trade. And also, again, the cultural practice of dance must be acknowledged and brought into the conversation. You know, um, Africa is a continent with 52 countries. That means 52 different types of traditions, songs, languages, um, and tons of information. And like people dance for several reasons. People dance for a harvest, people dance for, for it to rain, people dance when babies are born, people dance to celebrate, people dance when um, their loved ones become ancestors and make their transition. And so, you know, these cultural practices of dance exist again outside of the proscenium experience. And so what cultural practices do you come from in your lineage? Are those parts of your dance making? Is, is that part of your choreographic process and conversation? Um, oftentimes I find that, you know, in the Western world and just, you know, training, I went to UW-Madison, so, you know, go Badgers. There's this idea of like, 
creating that completely erases who you are. So you're learning these tools and these ways of creating that seem really like open, but they're not that open and they limit possibility. When you use the same tools over and over again, we limit possibility. You limit what could what could happen in a space because we have very set ideas about what is unison, what is a monolithic body, what is repetition, you know. Um, I went to see an Urban Bushman performance at Jacob's Pillow, I was there last year, and the conversations about their work by people who do not study in diasporic forms was quite appalling to me, you know, people's ideas of what unison is supposed to look like, what um, relationship to music is supposed to look like are very much narrow and specific to this tradition of creating that very much came out of like the Judson Church and like what we have defined in concert dance space as contemporary dance. And we also must validate, we need to actively research, explore, train, and support non-Western forms of dance and their contributions. You cannot discuss Black dance if you've not taken an African dance class, point blank period. So if you're not going to go and take a dance class in other forms, you have no authority, no business discussing what is Africanist aesthetics, what is Black dance, and what are Black contributions, because you couldn't even recognize them if they were standing right in front of you. And so I think that's super important again, because in doing that, we decenter the canon. We're consistently talking about how, you know, in contemporary dance, like this is like a requirement in college dance programs. And then um, African diasporic forms are considered an elective. But if we would validate their contributions, we would actually see that African dance has been living inside of contemporary forms from the very beginning. It's been living in ballet from the beginning. As we know, historically, ballet is only like what, at this point, 500, maybe 600 years old. And yet the oldest person in the world was found in Africa. So if the people dance and everyone comes from Africa, we can no longer be saying that ballet is the foundation of all dance. It's just one ethnic form. And so all of these things are super important because what happens is, is when black people start creating work in this way, and they are going against political structures and institutions, um, in programs, um, in intensives, there's immediately a tension, there's immediately um, a collision with that. And so then we're in these power struggles of you don't validate black dance, you don't think it's important, and we're trying to create in a way that's authentic to us. And you can't even understand it or have language to experience it because you won't even train in it, you won't even study it, you won't even research it. And so I think these things are super important in decolonizing um, choreographic practices. Um, it's important because oftentimes, uh, you know, we hear about, well, you're, I've heard the comments about my work, like you're creating work and you're leaving us out. It's a secret. Why won't you tell us about it? And I'm just like, go take an African dance class. Like it's no one's hiding anything from you. It's just, you don't know because you don't study. And so it's interesting that Black, brown, indigenous people, we have receipts into white culture, right? American culture is pretty much white culture. It's the mainstream culture. All black dancers take ballet. All black dancers take modern. All black dancers take contemporary. We all know who Martha Graham is. We all know who Trisha Brown is. We all know all these white choreographers, but how many of you can name 10 black choreographers and not, and not include the name Alvin Ailey? Like how many of you can really do that? Like some people don't even know who Pearl Primus is, Catherine Dunham, Tally Beatty, or even contemporary choreographers who are consistently shifting what black dance is looking like. Diane McIntyre, Jermaine Cogney, like there's so many people. And so that's also another thing as well, from a historical perspective, I was never taught dance history as culturally relevant to me. You know, you kind of hear that like, you know, but like it's like the chocolate chips in the box of vanilla wafers. So you got a couple chocolate chips in there like, oh, you know, they did that, they did this, you know, Alvin Ailey's over there, DTH is over there, but we don't actually excavate like what were the processes of these choreographers? Like, do you know that Catherine Dunn was actually an anthropologist and she was traveling and going to these places and studying the cultures of people and, and, and like immersing herself from like a ethnography perspective to create her work? Like, are we learning that? No, we have to go read her autobiography and then go do that work ourselves. And so when we start talking about choreography, a performance, how you're looking at performance, you know, some questions are, how are you upholding white supremacy when you create? How are you dismantling white supremacy when you create? Um, what are ways in which you are trying to honor the cultural lineages of the people in your work? 
Are you using blackness, which is a political side of, of information to make your work edgy? Do you have black tokens in your work? That's happening a lot in the contemporary dance field. Um, when you have your dancers generating, are they citing where they get things from? We have a lot of people creating work that seems ambiguous, but really reads to a black person as cultural appropriation. And that's only because no one is acknowledging the contributions of black people. We see this in the work of ballet choreographers with the aesthetic of cool. We see this, you know, inside of contemporary work where we're like, this is culturally appropriated. You took black culture, you whitewashed it, and now it's edgy and ambiguous for white audiences. But to me, it reads as an insult because I know your languages and I know your culture. So, you know, these are some of my thoughts on um, decolonizing choreography. I'm gonna stop sharing now. How do I, oh, right there. Um, I think it's super important that we continue to decolonize our ideas of what is composition, how we create and how we value dance. Um, it's important to the future of the field because dance is consistently changing and just honoring where, where people are coming from. We all have different experiences, um, opportunities, um, travel, some of us read more than others, some of us can't read and need to learn how to read, you know, and so it's important that we continue to push the boundaries of who is defining concert dance, what stories get to be told, what are the process, processes in which we make storytelling or share stories and honor all forms of expression. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Tiffany Mary Brown. <laughs> Young scholars come through, young scholars come through, young scholars come through. Yes, yes, yes. And if you noticed, she did not glance down that one time. This information is living and running inside of her blood. That's what you call brilliance. And I honor that. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, a lot, take a deep breath. One thing that I love about going to Deering the States and I miss about Deering the States, the Black Artist Talks here is that they always have uh, libations. And so this is a libation moment. I really need some gin and ginger ale right now. So thank you and thank you. So we're going to move forward. Uh, we have Melissa, Melissa Kobala. Nina's over there drinking something. I wonder if it's gin. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, it's great. So we have Melissa Kobala Gutierrez. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And we're transferring over to Melissa, 15 minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was... Ooh, I'm still marinating on a lot of that information and, you know, definitely a tough um, act to follow, but I'm just gonna um, hopefully continue building and expanding on what my colleagues have already shared. So let me go ahead and share my screen one second. Uh, and then can you give me a thumbs up if you see? Okay, great. Okay, so. Um, again, continuing on the lens of the colonization of dance, but we're going to be looking a little bit more specifically into dance programs and dance curriculum. Um, also coming from a student experience, since I recently graduated from uh, a dance program and institution, and also um, even having conversations with my other colleagues about their experiences in other dance programs. Okay, so two questions that we're going to be exploring simultaneously. Um, how has colonization affected dance programs and dance curriculum? And what needs to shift or change? So these are things that we're going to be exploring as we go through the presentation. The first point um, or first subject I want to make note of is the underrepresentation of non-Western forms, both in curriculum and performance. So even from the beginning, and Florencia mentioned this in her presentation as well, talking about the audition requirements or criteria that's needed for students to enter um, into dance programs. So personally, I, um, I actually started formally training what we call, you know, I, having a studio practice when I was 18. And I found myself having two years to uh, study these forms such as ballet and modern, which are usually the criteria or requirements that are asked for students to enter into the uh, dance programs in majority of um, the US. And I found myself with two years to be able to somehow gain proficiency in these forms in order for me to even be considered inside of a dance program. And again, I learned a lot. I feel like it helped me uh, to gain a lot of growth personally, but it was definitely very challenging. But even in my training, I also was receiving not only modern and ballet, but I was also um, having West African jazz salsa and other styles that allow me to open up my body and explore my fluidity in different ways. So again, even by just looking at the audition requirement, we can start to see what is being placed higher in terms of 
Um, what are we really giving value to as in this is what you need to know in order to even study or given the opportunity to study dance. Um, in terms of Western forms, such as ballet and modern being part of the curriculum while having other forms as elective or extracurricular activities, um, such as West African jazz, tap, hip hop, Latin ballroom salsa. And these are things that again were mentioned throughout the presentations. Um, and I also put in quotations again, the word modern. We spoke a little bit about it as well. Tiffany did, Ms. Mary also um, uh, mentioned how is calls for cultural appropriation. And actually also another resource uh, in uh, Brenda Dixon's Got Child in her 1996 text, Digging into Africanist Presence in American Performance. She also talks about how uh, Eurocentric and African, Africanist aesthetic is embedded in modern dance, you know, with the movement of the polyrhythm and, and polycentric. And even how there's this youth vitality by still keeping a cool nonchalant attitude um, uh, the looseness and laid back energy, and also even how George Balanchine exploited uh, or explored the different dynamics of um, uh, syncopation and speed in their in her com in his company, and then having the ballet dancers also go through that ease with the body that's usually portrayed. So all these things, you know, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, they are part of the Africanist aesthetic. And again, just seeing how these forms are being valued or put in a pedestal, um, ballet and modern as in, this is what you need to get a professional career. This is what you need to get a bachelor's of fine arts or a master's of fine arts. And then the other things are not as valued. You can either choose to engage in them or not. So, I mean, these are things that definitely we need to start addressing and putting questions on. This brings us to the question also of what do we consider technique? So in the article, um, I don't want to do African, um, what about my technique by uh, Raquel El Monroe, she puts the definition. So she talks uh, to her colleagues and they bring out several definitions of technique. So uh, several of those definitions are, it's a system of training typically using repetition that facilitates the ability to do anything. It's a system of neuro neurological pattern, the principle of specificity. And in my words, is the ability to move in the most efficient way as means of reducing risk of injury, therefore being able to have a consistent execution or longer career in whatever art form you're um, studying. So again, we don't see ballet or modern being mentioned in any of these definitions. Um, we actually see the consistency and the practice that it takes for technique in order for you to engage your body and with the most fluidity that you can in different ways. So again, taking the, the consideration of this definition, we can definitely exclude ballet and modern as being the core or foundation of dance, just like we've heard um, throughout our lives. Um, addressing dress code, Florencia also spoke a little bit about it, specifically in ballet and having tights. I think now, uh, specifically that more companies such as Capizio, they're actually making and diversifying the skin color of tights. Uh, we can actually, or these uh, dance programs should open up to include black and brown students inside of their dress code. Because uh, um, I think we've made progress. Uh, a lot of these programs are starting to do this, but at the same time, there are several institutions and studios in which they're still requiring pink and um, pink tights and pink shoes. And then having one or two or more Afro-Desperic works in dance performance to showcase diversity, quote unquote, while showcasing Western forms for the rest of the program. So again, I put a quote unquote the world diversity because I'm challenging this word as well because having one or two Afro-Desperic works doesn't necessarily mean that it's diversity. Diversity means having several styles. So by having one or two, you're just trying to put out the point of a presentation. Oh, here it is, like we have one or two styles. So there you go, we are diverse. And that's not really the reality. So just even taking into, into consideration who's behind the panels of, of selection, because a lot of the times the works are adjudicated or they go through a, a process of selection in order to make it to the stage. Um, having a majority white dance faculty, representation matters and support. So even just nowadays in predominantly white institutions, how um, black faculty is still something that we need to be asking questions about because representation matters even for students of color in these institutions. And again, I think you can develop relationships with faculty that would go across your career and professional life and personal life. But I do think that having black fac faculty who can share your experiences as a student of color and can voice them in meetings is very important. And not also that, I think also support. 
because who's supporting the, the black faculty in itself so that the change can actually happen? Because a lot of the times there's only one or two or three, and then the rest are actually um, promoting a systemic, systemic racism inside of these institutions. So again, how are we representing, but also how is the support for the faculty? Um, a little bit on uh, oppression of the black body. Again, Florence touched on this, having the dancers ballet body, usually a flat chest, a flat butt, uh, which causes stereotypes on black bodies. And this can create a lot of emotional, mental, and physical health um, affected when it comes to, even just because of the ways that we have to navigate in these institutions. Um, moving too vigorously or too strong, being asked to tone it down to fit a certain aesthetic. And again, there's a difference between exploring different levels of energy or dynamics. And I think that's actually important because that allows you to navigate and, and, and understand how your body moves in different ways. So maybe going from a one to a two to a three to a seven to a 10, one being the lowest dynamic energy, 10 being the highest. Um, and how um, are we actually navigating through these levels? The issue comes in when you're asking black and brown dancers to tone it down just to fit a certain aesthetic that is considered the norm or more pleasing pleasantly aesthetic, um, aesthetically, or even just because this is what you're supposed to look like. So you're, you're reprimanding the energy and the individuality of each person, um, which we know in dance, everybody has their way of moving and their individual contribution, contributions. Also training primarily in Western forms can place certain restrictions or regulations in the body coming from an Afro diaspora training with polyrhythms. And I mean, we can see this as well for the people who have only trained in Western forms. Um, it's harder for them to come into an Afro diasporic form and then really find the connection and rootedness of the pelvis with the floor and the connection with mother earth. And really understanding, um, and this also coming from personal experience and, and having conversations with colleagues as well and understanding how so, uh, some of these forms are actually placed in the body in, in certain restrictions and boxes when we come from the African diaspora. And again, Tiffany said, it's a dance, it's part of everything. It's part of uh, celebrations, it's part of ceremonies. So even having that freedom to express, we find ourselves having to retrain our bodies or even recondition, which is dancers that's, you know, we usually do that in, in the time span of our careers, but it's just something to take a notice of how these techniques can actually reprimand the body as well. Use for photo advertising in order to showcase diversity, but not really give an opportunity. And again, this is something that we've seen a lot is just seeing how the main photos of maybe concerts or flyers, they're portraying black and brown dancers, but when you actually look inside of the program, they're not really giving performance opportunities or the same opportunities as the other um, colleagues. Immediately considering that because you're black, you can do certain styles, a common one is hip hop. Um, and you know, me and my colleagues have also gone through this experience a lot, especially going through or applying for a, a teaching position. And immediately one of the things that they ask you is like, can you do hip hop? So this is you know, definitely a way of showcasing how, again, stereotypes are being placed in the body or in black bodies and in and, and black and brown and indigenous bodies. Receiving comments such as, I'm so surprised by the way I saw you dance on stage. I didn't know you could move like that. Well, being in class together every day. And again, I know these are not meant as harmful. They're meant actually as compliments, but when you actually uh, deconstruct these comments, you can start to see because based on uh, a proscenium or a concert stage performance, you're directly looking at the person. So there's no other way that you could miss them unless you know, you're know you on your phone or you're doing something else. But the problem is that when you're receiving these comments from especially people that are with you every day, is showcasing how invisibility is actually being also placed inside of these dance spaces and classes when it comes to black and brown bodies. Other ways that I'm not gonna go uh, deeply in because of time, but again, we have dance companies, black dance companies have been created throughout the years just so that we could give opportunities to black dancers um, to even be in the space. And again, there's always uh, white dance companies that they give, um, they give jobs and roles to black dancers, but are usually one or two, again, being the token. And you know, as black, uh, as black people, I believe we always, or in some sort of period of our lives, we've been the only one and we know how hard it is to navigate in those spaces. Um, 
again, not touching deeply, but unequal funding, uh, given funding specifically only to white companies or white passing dance companies, Latinx as well. And so that brings a lot of questions in regards to who are the board members? Is there even representation there? Um, how are the funds being allocated? What are the criteria? And uh, how, are the, how is the decision making, right? So, and also in terms of um, going now to the other term appropriation, which again, talking about how African aesthetics have actually been inside of modern dance and they're not being recognized, but appropriation is a big, big um, subject of how uh, dance programs have also been colonized of taking in information and then not giving recognition. A lot of the times the words that I'm being used or I'm influenced or I'm, I'm inspired by um, this specific thing, but even if you're influenced or inspired, there still needs to be a level of recognition because this is information that's coming from people who are sharing their stories um, as well as you will like if you share your stories for people to give you recognition of yours. And determining, determining positions and in institutions and requirements, we spoke a little bit about this as well, representation matters and support and who are making the decision in regards to how are people um, being able to enter into dance institutions, what are the requirements, we know that in order to um, be in a, in a position at a dance institution university, you need a master's of fine arts degree. Um, so even all of these requirements, how can we start asking questions and really deconstruct this information so that we can understand uh, who was really given the possibility and the voice to be even in these spaces. Um, to finish, I would like to leave us with two quotes, one of them by Martin Luther King, and he says, one second, let me move this. An individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. Also, I mean, taking into consideration, and my colleagues have mentioned this, the work that it takes to, to do this work. Um, it's, you know, it's uh, Brittany Williams, she's actually here, and she's one of the founders as well of the Florida Black Dance Artist Organization, activist, amazing woman, organizer, dancer, performer. She likes to say that this work is messy, and it is because you come in with not all the answers. Um, you come in a lot of the times putting yourself in the forefront and receiving um, those, those um, effects, and then just even uh, understanding how to engage in that work can be really, really challenging. But again, we are not, uh, because it's challenging doesn't mean that we are able to shy away from it. And I, one of the pillars that I want to bring up is love. And I know love is a uh, very romanticized, but I do think that with love, we'll be able to, to continue engaging consistency and with integrity um, and support for each other and mainly also care for each other and for ourselves, which I think self-care is so important, especially in these times that we're living. Um, so how can we continue to carry love in our practice and as one of the pillars that we're actually exercising inside of this work? And by that, I'll leave you with Maya Angelou's words that says, in the flesh of love's light, we dare be brave. And suddenly we see that love costs us all we are and will ever be. Yet it is only love which set us free. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Young scholars come through, young scholars come through, young scholars come through. So I hope that you're preparing your questions. We're going to move forward with Akitha Carey, all in love. Please get your questions together. Thank you, Melissa, for that info. That was fabulous. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, everyone. Um, so hopefully I can tie everything together. I've been making my own notes on the side. Um, so again, I want to thank Michelle Murray and the Daring Estates for having this opportunity to share um, something that is so deeply a part of who I am as an artist and especially as an activist um, for this type of work. So the first thing I wanna do is acknowledge the need, necessity and importance of having black women on faculty and staff. So I just wanna recognize um, that, the, that what you see today in, in terms of Tiffany and Melissa is really based on the exceptional work that Michelle Murray has done. She is an amazing, amazing mentor for these young women. And I think this is um, an exemplary um, performance of what it means and the benefits of having 
Black women on faculty. Um, so also going back to Augusto's point where he mentioned the Black body and what that means, particularly the Black female body. So he made note that the body is disruptive. Um, it's, it's an experiment. It's incomprehensible. It's a collision with whiteness. So I want to talk about essentially what Black women mean to departments and in, in terms of faculty and staff and the benefits of having women of color who are going to add and decolonize and deconstruct curriculum that has been meant to um, demean and tear students of color apart. So when I think about um, Linda Smith's tax decolonizing methodology, she mentions, she mentions 25 um, things that occur within the thought process of, of doing this type of work. So she mentions naming and claiming, storytelling and testimony, survival and surveillance, remembering, connecting, representing, intervening, envisioning, re-envisioning, um, restoring, returning, protecting, rereading, which is basically a critical reading of Western history. So if you don't have a person of color who is engaging in this work, because many times it is our lived experience that is going to be able to see through and navigate and help students all students, not even students of color, all students reframe and reshift their way of thinking, then there's the, the curriculum, the ideology is never going to change. So this is why having black women in particular on faculty is of huge importance. So with that said, I just want to recognize my mentors, um, Dr. Yvonne Daniel, Dr. Brenda Dixon Godschild, Dr. Cynthia Oliver, Dr. Andrea Queeley and Michelle Murray. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my decolonization practice, carob funk technique. Um, so before I get into that, I want to basically talk about it in terms of it being a call to action, a call and response and um, thinking about it in, in multiple veins because it's a part of my dissertation research. So I'm really interested in this idea of the erotic is power, erotic subjectivity and erotic performance. So within, within the lens or within the vocabulary of eroticism, we are, def we are redefining it. So Audre Lorde, black feminist, amazing warrior woman has given us this language and this terminology that is saying it is not a Western concept in terms of pornography or pornography. It is, it is about empowering, it is about um, agency, it's about exceptionalism. And so walking in the strength to be able to be your best self in these environments that have been constructed to make you think that you are less than. So this is really how I've constructed my thought process about the body and about curriculum and about curriculum reform. So Carib Funk is rooted out of colonialism and colonial ideology. Um, I've had two or two defining moments in my early childhood or adolescent um, experience, but as a as a student matriculating through school and in um, college and as an educator, I've had numerous traumatic experiences. But in terms of the dance technique um, and being in a colonized country, I'm originally from the Bahamas. So you're thinking, or I'm thinking, I'm in a, a country that celebrates um, Caribbean cultural performance that celebrates the black moving body that celebrates this hip wine rotation. Um, but I had two major situations where I was shamed in a public setting, told that women don't dance like that, um, told that basically, you know, I need to stop doing what I'm doing. So in, in that moment, I did not understand what was happening. Um, but I, but you know, God saw something with within that moment that was going to be um, 
a life changing opportunity for not only myself, but for other people who may have had that's had a similar experience. So the dance technique is rooted essentially within movement um, or movements that have informed me. I mean, I'm classically trained. My first introduction to dance was classical ballet in the Bahamas juxtaposition, right? Um, but I was introduced to African diaspora dance forms through the amazing work of Karen Stord in Black Door Dance. And if you are familiar with who that is, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're not, you really need to be educated on the work and the lineage of what she has done. Um, so I was introduced to Haitian. I was introduced to all of these other dance forms. But because I grew up on a, on a Caribbean island, I was exposed to dance hall soca and calypso so all of this has framed um the way that i think about movement so coming to the united states i was kind of struggling with who i was as an artist so i i was not sure or comfortable or confident in the, in the way of expressing how i thought about movement so that's the genesis so thinking about my issues with colonialism and shaming and and adding gender and respectability politics on top of that and these fusions of forms that you know in a in a um collegiate experience are working in resistance with each other so these are the politics that i'm dealing with so in a nutshell, you know, I'm looking at power, resistance, agency, um, satisfaction, excellence, the, the, the interconnections between sensuality and sexuality. So Carib Funk within itself is a decolonizing methodology. So this is what I teach in higher education. When I'm commissioned to come in and set a work or when I come in as a guest artist, this is the work that I'm doing. And so with, within this framework, I am dealing with racist constructs. I'm dealing with white supremacy. I'm dealing with epistemological apartheid. So I'm also dealing with being a black woman in a white space, doing movement that's been highly sexualized, highly misread, highly miscoded. Um, so these are these are the triple, quadruple, sextuple things, issues, the politics that I have to address and deal with in the work. Um, and I can tell you that I have taught across the country. And I always said to myself, why am I going to all of these different institutions? But I've gone to teach at all of these different institutions. I think so God was showing me the landscape of what needed to be done and the fact that racism and academic structural racism, there, it is a blueprint that has been placed on institutions across the nation. This is a global issue and um, it's gonna take a global effort to deconstruct the, the, the constructs that have tr for years traumatized. I mean, everybody that has been speaking has talked about the ways that this, um, the ways that this work manifests. Um, and, and I'm hoping that we can have a, a larger conversation about the tools and the methodologies and the strategies to deconstruct what uh, many of us have experienced. So to frame my discussion, I want to share with you a question that was posed by the legendary African-American sociologist, W.E.D. Du Bois. So in, his, um, in the text, The Souls of Black Folk, he is asked this question by a white person, how does it feel to be a problem? And I think this is really foundational in terms of how I have either seen myself, and this is, goes back to this double consciousness, right? The way that you are perceiving yourself through the eyes of others. So the way that we are seen as black people, black women in spaces as a problem. So this is the weight that we wear on our backs, on our shoulders, in and outside of the dance studios, in the world, the walks of life, everywhere that we go, we are considered to be a problem. 
You are too dark. You are too tall. You are too thick. You are not the right gender. You are not from the right space. You don't have the right clothing. You don't have the right socioeconomic background. We are walking in all of these ideas about what we are not and trying to be what we shall be, what we are supposed to be, who we are, this sense of um, identity is something that we are always struggling with in these spaces. So this is the this is the framing of of the things that everyone has talked about. We are considered a problem, not not in the United States. This is a global conversation. Black and brown people are considered a problem. So when you think about how to change the mindset, because it's it's about changing that that innate misunderstanding that is deeply rooted within the DNA. Because when we talk about ancestral memory and what that does for people of color, you have to talk about that ancestral memory of slavery and oppression and what you what you believe to be different, how you see yourself differently, how you see yourself better than other people. So this is this is work that is deeply embedded in the psyche, in the in the DNA of everybody. And Augusto talked about, you know, the oppressor and the the one that is being oppressed. Nobody is happy in this situation. Even if the oppressor doesn't recognize what they are doing, they 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 are suffering in, in some way. Um, so all of that being said, we want to really think about how to address the problem. And the problem is for too long, we have been working within a system that does not recognize people of color, blackness, indigeneity. Um, there, there is a disconnect and we are trying to place ourselves in systems that do not recognize who we are in terms of faculty. Um, it's problematic when there is no one on faculty, even in 2020, you have people on faculty that look the same, that are all white, that are thinking the same way. You have students that are coming into departments where they have no support. This is problematic, this is traumatic. How do you expect a student to be successful in an environment where they have no support? So in my last two minutes, I want to talk about um, how I've structured my dance technique to function in two veins, a movement technology and a theoretical component. So I'm trying to tackle two things at once. And I do this in my dance appreciation class and my dance history class as well. But in terms of having a technique um, that is able to address the issue. So again, in terms of answering the question of responding to the problem, Carib Funk is one opportunity, one answer to um, this issue in terms of the black body being in a space, recognizing um, African or Africanized or African diaspora movement, being taught that movement, um, being informed of the context, the, the history, and in terms of the theoretical component, reading about, writing about, centering on movement, culture, ideology, language that is highly representative of the environment. So in terms of spatial structure, what does that mean in terms of connection and in, in terms of community, um, in terms of projects, centering projects, focusing on the African diaspora, centering readings on the African diaspora, centering how we connect within movements that are associated with Caribbean cultural performance. So again, this is one methodology that is attempting to um, deconstruct and decenter and eradicate um, epistemologies that are presenting this one-sided Eurocentric um, ideology. So I'll close with this. Eurocentric ideology has been and continues to be problematic. It is oppressive. It is restrictive, it is exclusionary, it is constraining, it is destructive, it is trauma-inducing, it is biased, it is racist, it is sexist, it has no respect and regard for the other and indigeneity, and 
what our communities celebrate and honor. It is rooted in erasure and it needs to be eradicated. Thank you. Well then, thank you very, very much, Ms. Akita Carey. Each one of these um, conversations and presentations today has the ability to be its own Black artist talk. I know it's a lot, so take a deep breath. We do have um, two minutes <laughs> for questions. So um, I've been going through the chat. I haven't seen any questions, but if you have questions, please, please, please put it in the chat. Love to hear from you. I think we may have... One, three, ah, I see three, okay. Ulysse Easton, the educator must be given checks and balances and stick to the curriculum that should not be, ba should not be the basis on personal likes and dislikes. Catherine Dunham did the work and research and researched it. It should, it should not be a preference. The technique must be a requirement, especially when 40 to 50% of the students are black. Yes, Ulysse, thank you. Ah, okay. Okay, do we have any questions, comments? I have a question. I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> for any, for, for the young aspiring dancers and for anyone who's a parent and, and supporting a young dancer or, or even a, a guardian or someone who, or a sponsor, um, are there any programs anywhere in the world that are kind of doing this type of work in existence? I mean, not to put you on the spot to choose one or promote one, but are there any? Perfect. <laughs> so Brittany posted in the chat, Wish It Dance. So Wish It Dance is an online dance platform that launched on March 19th. We went into quarantine on March 12th and we launched on March 19th. And it's specific black space where we're teaching everything from a black aesthetic and a black perspective. Um, actually, I teach at Miami Dade College Kindle Campus and I, and I teach in that way. I've always taught from a Africanist perspective, and I am also what you call quote unquote classically trained, whatever that is for you, um, bunhead to the core. But I do understand and I do know the root of the information and how, how to teach it. Um, that's very interesting considering that I live in a space that has such so much black diversity, um, but the level of erasure and how that black diversity exists inside of white spaces is very interesting. It's a love, I like to call it a love-hate relationship. You know, you, you love it, you want to promote it, you want to do the work, you bring it in for the festival. However, when it comes to actually teaching and deconstructing the work and having it inside of the quote unquote conservatory based programs, it's just for entertainment. And that doesn't get you anywhere. That does not get you a job. And the reason that the dancers don't make money is because they don't know the work they're not able to come fluidly in and out from one point to the next with the ashe, a lamban, a sente, a chasse, a pot de and a brise all in one breath. And that's necessary. Okay. I'm gonna share all of your um, websites in the chat so you can all follow along, but any other links to your courses, please also share that too, because I know we have a lot of dance students and, and dancers that are gonna be looking at this and I really wanna share with them all of the resources. I wanna also mention that Ulysse Easton posted inside of the chat, African Heritage Cultural Center, which is on 62nd Street and 22nd Avenue, 45 years of existence has been instrumental in embracing artists that need, this needs to be, it needs life. So please make sure that you check it out. We also mentioned their first modern dance teacher earlier in the conversation, uh, Dr. Uh, Latoinette Stein, who actually created her technique, Lantec, at the African Heritage Cultural Center. And that's a worldwide global technique that exists and doesn't exist here in Miami. I don't understand, but you know, we have work to do. And so please check that out. And thank you, Ulysse, for joining us in the African Heritage Cultural Center. So, 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 so nice to share this space with you. I love you.
Um, I don't have a question, but just to add on to what Ms. Murray said, this is the whole point of this presentation to say, hey, does a school exist? This is the disruption so that it doesn't exist, right? And so just like structurally, institutionally, um, we are taught other histories instead of our own. This is the point of your question actually um, gives um, not that you need it, but the validation of all the people's presentations today around most of the jazz, hip, if you look at hip hop, all American dance came out of African American cultural, social dances, etc. yet we don't have institutions of our own specifically to teach it and on a universal, like un, in universities, et cetera, right? And so we become the electives and et cetera, et cetera. So your question <laughs> is why we're here. <laughs> Laura Murphy just asked a question in the chat. She said, where is the technique that Michelle just mentioned? It's Alujimi dance technique. It's a technique that I train dancers in. Um, you can hit me up, inbox me, or you can email me, alujimidance at gmail.com. I'll post it in the chat. Thank you. So we are 404, which is my... Um, numerology sign to pay attention. <laughs> Thank you all so much. All of you stayed with us throughout the entire time. Y'all you'll stick it up. Thank you so much for hanging in there and staying with us. It was a great conversation today. I'm really excited about the possibilities and the information that has been shared. I can definitely see these presentations growing into bigger and better things. So we will see you soon. Thank you, Daring the States. Thank you, Melissa, again, for your, your support and your assistance. This was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And thank you to the panelists, Akita, Tiffany, Augusto, Melissa, and Florencia. Thank you so much, so, so very, very much for today for sharing your wisdom with us. I am deeply, deeply appreciative, and I love you so very much. And I mean that all in love. Thank you. Have a great day. Ciao. <laughs>